Hello everyone um, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Hannah Presswell and I am the editors of Art Has No Borders and today we're going to be talking to you about getting a sneak peek at what goes on behind the curtain during the selection process of open exhibitions and jury competitions. We'll be giving you pointers about how to choose an exhibition, tips so that you can do everything possible to ensure that your art has, it, has the best chance of being selected. You should have received an email with a free handout for you to print out and take notes on, but if you didn't get it, you can click on the link in the sidebar to get a PDF right now, and then you can print it out. And while you're doing that, I'll just go over quickly how you can participate. Mainly, just listen to everything that we're, we're going to be saying. You can also, in the sidebar, ask us any questions that you might have, and you can also just replay this again another time it'll be going up on a YouTube account so you can do that. So let's get started. Joining me today is Catherine Roberts. Catherine, who is originally from the States, has been working with artists in the UK for the past eight years. She founded Cork Street Open Exhibitions which ran over a six-year period showcasing the work of hundreds of artists from around the world in the gallery in Cork Street in the centre of London. She also has two publishing imprints that specialise in designing and producing iArt books for iBook stores worldwide. She has helped hundreds of artists build the business side of their art practices to sell more art through her online courses and coaching programmes. Hello Catherine. Hi Hannah. This is the first um, webinar that Hannah and I have done together. So hello everyone out there. I just want to say first of all thank you Hannah for taking over Art Has No Borders. It was a very long and painful birthing process. We had quite a few false starts, and it's just really, really nice to know that you're at the helm and that it's all in good hands now. So thank you very much for that. And I wondered if you could maybe just take a minute to tell everyone a little bit about your journey into the art world so they knew who you are. Okay, yeah, sure. Well, I studied fine art at university, and I've only just recently graduated this summer from Nottingham Trent. I'm still trying to continue my own art practice after graduation and I do really understand the importance that kind of open exhibitions and competitions can have on elevating an artist's career and just giving them more exposure in general. I love discovering new artists and really like being part of that process of exposing them and kind of elevating their career. And Art Has No Borders really is a great place to reveal some great artistic talent, new and old, established. It's great just to show off great artwork to a wide audience with our, our new publications and I'm really glad to be on board. Oh great, well it is really really great to have you every day on IFA. <laughs> so let's dive in, get started. I think we probably should just start off with definitions. We're talking about open exhibitions, juried competitions, what exactly are we talking about? Well when I think of an open exhibition or a jury competition, uh, a few things come to mind. First of all, for me, it needs to have a formal entry process and some sort of a standardized selection process. It usually in involves the review of the artwork by a panel or a, some sort of committee, a group of judges that have obviously some relevance to the subject matter or to the artwork in general. And Sometimes, depending on the association, there may be a review of the artist's credentials as well as the artwork itself, but some sort of formal um, entry and review process. And then the second sort of criteria for me when I'm thinking of what qualifies as an open exhibition or a jury competition is that the selected work is either exhibited in a physical or in an online space, um, so in a gallery or somewhere online or is published in a print or digital publication. So there's a standard process that's really clear and, and obvious to see and figure out, and then a selection process, and then some sort of publication of the work. OK. It, it seems like, to me, the most obvious reason for an artist to enter their work into these kind of competitions would just be for a chance to have their work seen, hopefully sold, but there's actually quite a lot more to it than that, isn't there? Well, there is from a business point of view. You know, and it's funny because with Cork Street Open Exhibitions, it seemed like a lot of artists had the expectation that they were entering so that their work could be on Cork Street and would sell for big bucks, big money. And in fact, actually, I think the 
opportunity to sell your work is pretty low down the list as far as what you can gain from open exhibitions. The, the biggest, I think, and, and most valuable piece from a marketing point of view, which is kind of the hat that I always wear, is to either be building your own credibility and therefore enhancing your CV. So when you go to approach galleries or with, even if you're already working with a gallery, you're constantly looking for ways to, to become more credible in the eyes of collectors or potential collectors. So for me, when you have the series of jury competitions or open exhibitions on your CV, that's saying to the public that professionals in the field have selected my work against others that I was competing with, and, and it gives it some validation in the outer world, in the public world. Another reason is to be seen by judges. And that may seem small, and you know you think they see thousands of work. But the thing is, what happens is, if, if your work is seen repeatedly, and that's either in a publication, a magazine, or some sort of article, or online, if it becomes familiar to people, and obviously you want to have a very distinct and identifiable style, but they start to recognize your work. And that is really valuable from a sales point of view. So to be seen by judges and the public to find new markets in a small way to get feedback for your work, um, because while it's a very subjective process, and we'll play, I'll harp on this probably a little bit, because it's really important to keep in mind when you're entering things and not getting your work selected, it's very subjective, but if you continue to enter your work and it's never selected, then you need to look at your work and, and whether or not this is an appropriate sort of place for your work to be shown. Yeah. Kind of how do you think an artist knows what exhibitions they should be entering? Which one which ones are right for them? Well, first of all, it's really important to be selective. And, you know, my inbox is always full of opportunities. My husband is an artist as well and he gets loads and loads and loads of emails for different ways to participate. Um, in open exhibitions or in publications online, galleries online. And I always say that it's important to, if at all possible, visit an exhibition in birth that you plan to submit to. Now, obviously, most exhibitions happen once a year, so that's sometimes challenging. But this is not a sprint. Building your art business is a marathon. People have heard me say that before. It's not a sprint. So it really does serve you well to plan out in ahead which exhibitions that you're going to enter. You can do this, first of all, let me go back a bit, because one thing you never want to do is try and create work for a particular um, event or exhibition. Always a big mistake. What you need is to have your own distinct and identifiable style, your voice as an artist, and then find the exhibitions that that suits or that that fits into. And you can look at the theme. You know, obviously, if you're a animal, if you're an animal artist, you don't necessarily want to be entering a maritime exhibition. Or if you're completely abstract, you want to avoid associations or organizations that are just in traditional work. You can you can look at past entries and past exhibitions, either online or through a catalog, and get a sense of what sort of things they were looking for and what sort of level the artists were in. You can often see the names of the artists, do a little research on Google, and find out if they're sort of at the same level as you. If you're visiting a person, you can look at the prices and see how you know where your art would fit in. But it's just really important to know how your work would fit among what you see there. And obviously, the entries are going to change each year. Sometimes you can look at judges or often curators, or they're involved in a gallery. You can look at the types of things they like. But don't just enter everything that you see or everything that comes along. Make sure that you're targeting the events you want to participate in. Yeah, and also you've kind of got to know all the costs and all those potential payoffs that you could have from certain exhibitions as well. Yeah, you see, you need to have a plan. So as I said, you want to select which exhibitions you're going to participate in. Keep in mind that when you're entering, you may have overlap. So you need to reserve the work that you're going to put into a particular exhibition. Obviously, if it's selected for two exhibitions and it sells at the first one, you're done and you're out. <laughs> yeah. You can replace it with something else. No. Or, um, think that that's likely to happen. It may in some small exhibitions, but if the judges chose a specific work, it's unlikely that you'll be able to swap it out for another one. And then, again, you want to assess all the costs. It's not just the entry fees that you have as a cost, obviously. You need to have your work framed. If glazed, then mounted and framed. 
um, you need to account for the shipping costs to have your work sent to the venue, and don't forget to account for the cost and expense of it being shipped back because you cannot assume a sale. And for people that are entering overseas or abroad, you need to take into account any duties or customs, particularly if you're in the UK and it's going outside of the EU, or if you're in the States and you're entering work into um, an EU country. Those are all things that you really need to do some serious research on. And you need to pay attention also to the fact that most couriers will not insure artwork. So unless you're specifically using a art transport company, you need to really make sure that you've got the insurance covered in some way, either with your own business insurance or that you're using a courier that will insure art. Yeah, it's really important, that kind of costs and all the delivering. And once you've got it shortlisted, it sounds like here you've only been talking about physical exhibitions that take place in galleries. But what about kind of art has no borders, competitions online? What happens then? Well, you know, it's funny because when I started Polk Street Open Exhibition, it was really before artwork was so prevalent on, sales of artwork was so prevalent online. And I would have said at that time that, you know, I wouldn't have said avoid them, but I would have said there is less value in an online exhibition than in a physical exhibition. That has really changed in the last two to three years. The big auction houses, big money is moving online in art. And there are some online galleries that are consistently shifting artworks that are five to 10,000 um, pounds. Regularly, all of them have a guarantee program in place so, you know, if somebody's not totally happy with the artwork, it can come back. So, online sales have really, really increased. And with something like Art Has No Borders, where it's culminating in a digital publication, we're seeing a lot more publications as well. Uh, one thing you do need to be careful of is hidden costs. So for example, with Art Has No Borders, people pay an entry fee up front. My husband has gotten a lot of offers um, where nothing to enter, but then if you are uh, selected, and this one I'm thinking of is a print publication, if you're selected for the print publication, then you are required to make a payment. And in this one case, something in the States, it was something like three payments of $297. <laughs> I was like, whoa, that's not exactly free. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you did get one copy of the print book, though. So. Yeah, you'd like to think so, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, so you just need to look um, sort of around all the corners and just make sure that you're really seeing um, any of the fine print that might be there. I think I also just wanted to say that um, when it comes to publishing, you know, I was making kind of a joke about that print publication, but it is really important to remember that uh, Publishing, whether it's in magazines or books, is a really, really valid way to establish credibility in a subject to make you an expert. So um, even if you're if you're print if you're submitting articles to artists and illustrators, or if you're being interviewed in an art magazine, those don't underestimate the marketing value of those. So those, those things are really important, and that's why I think. I don't want to dwell on this, but that's why something like Art Has No Borders, that's one of the reasons that I think that it's a really good tool for artists, as well as, you know, physical open access. Yeah, it's assuming kind of an artist has done their research and they've made a list of exhibitions they want to enter, what do you think the key things they need to do to ensure that they've got the very best chance of having their work selected? Um, well, first and foremost is, as I've said, you know, make sure that your work is appropriate for the event, for the ex particular exhibition. Then I would say the very next thing is to make sure that you submit the absolute best photographs that you possibly can of your work. The judges, it used to be that 50-50, that you submitted online first or you brought in your work live. For example, the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, everybody brought all the work in. Now they even have a pre-judging stage, an online submission. So those judges, judges in most cases, are looking at literally thousands of artwork. So they are like, they're just like ripping past. So you have a very limited window to grab the judge's attention, a very limited. And your pictures should be the best possible pictures that you can possibly submit. Another thing is, if you have an opportunity to submit more than one uh, entry, then you should. 
because again, they're going by tick, 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 looking, you know, if you think of scrolling through a slideshow when you're looking for a picture, you're going boom, boom, boom. And if they see three artworks that are in a strong voice where, you know, they can tell that they're the same artist, it's distinct style, it will grab their attention. It's more likely to grab their attention and get them to stop and then take a closer look. So if you have the opportunity to submit more than one image, don't do one drawing, one sculpture, one, you know, painting, thinking, oh, I'm going to cover all the bases. That's not the best, that's not the best strategy. The best strategy is to take your strength, what you're best at, and then submit, you know, a series, not necessarily a formal series, but a group of work that really stands out as who you are as an artist. Another thing, oh, I could go on on this subject for a long time, but another thing is if there is a place to submit your CV, your bio, or your artist statement, do so. Don't leave those things blank. You know, if the judges are taking the time to review that information, for example, and there are literally hundreds of entries, sometimes thousands of artists, and you can't be bothered to, you know, submit the information or fill in the little blank or spell check your entries, then frankly, why should they take you seriously, you know, as an artist? It, it might seem like a small thing, but those are little details that when it comes down to choosing between A or B, say two artists are, are being looked at and, you know, it's a tough decision, those can be the tipping points. You know, those can be where decisions are made. So if you're going to do it, you know, better to submit to fewer opportunities and do it really well than to just kind of try and get everything all going at once. Yeah, so you really think the presentation does matter, even in those early stages of submitting work online? Absolutely. It, it, even more so in the early stages. And actually, if you don't if you don't catch the judge's attention right at the beginning or get shortlisted, you're never going to reach the end anyway. Very true. <laughs> Give it your best shot. Now, actually, I have a link. There you go. This is an article from a blog in the state, How to Photograph Your Art, and it goes into lighting, uh, natural lighting, outdoor lighting, which is obviously a lot funnier in Texas than it is here. But it's a great article. Um, if you can't afford to have your work professionally photographed, which I recommend if at all possible, then this is a really good place to start to get tips on what to look for and, and how to do it. And also, I wanted to give a few examples. Here's an example of an artwork. And you can tell the difference, and believe me, with Parkstream, we got submissions all the time, you know. The difference for a judge seeing that and this is you. With sculpture, sometimes, even, okay, even with flat work, often you have an opportunity to submit more than one image. So take advantage of it. Send in one picture of the full artwork like this, and then send in another that's a detail, or even two details, particularly with sculpture. So um, here's a, another example of sculpture photographed in the studio. This is not the time for your in situ pictures. <laughs> um, and, you know, have it. this is a professional photograph. You can tell there's a huge difference. And, again, it speaks volumes about how much value you put on your work um, in the judge's eyes. So and if you can't get it professionally photographed, at least, you know, put a sheet behind it of a contrasting color, a, not a wrinkly sheet, you know. <laughs> yeah. It sounds really absurd, but it can make a difference. And again, remember that this is competitive. So if you're going to take the time to figure out how to upload your work and how to submit and pay the money for the entries, make sure that you're giving yourself the best possible chance of success. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's assume that the artist isn't out, they've done all these things really well, they've photographed it well, their work has been shortlisted, what's next, what can they do now? Well, I think the very first thing you should do is go back and reread the terms and conditions. Read the fine print. Make sure that you're dotting all the I's and crossing your T's. If you have a chance to submit additional information, make sure that you've done it correctly. Check to see if they want inches or centimeters. So if it asks for height by width, make sure that that's how you've entered your figures, uh, your dimensions of your work. Just basically double check everything. And then also, if they had, if they gave you the opportunity to submit high resolution images, make sure that you have sent the absolute largest files that are allowed, the largest and cleanest files that you're allowed to send.
The reason is that they are going to pull from those entries, those images that they have for any publicity that they need to do for any print publicity. And so you have a real opportunity here. Let's say that there are 100 images shortlisted and five of those they have high resolution, good quality images for. Those are going to be the ones that they choose to use in any print publicity to send out with any press releases. So once again, we come back to how important it is to make sure that those photographs you have of your artwork are of the very best quality possible. The next thing you want to do is prepare your work to a gallery standard. In other words, this is not the time to be putting it in an IKEA frame. Sometimes an artist is a little too close to the work and it really can help to get an outside perspective on the best frame to suit the work. Take your work and go to a framer. Oftentimes a good framer will really have a lot of experience in knowing what sort of amount or what sort of a frame will really set your work off and show it at its best. Again, this is an example of going back to first impressions. You know, everybody says that a book isn't judged by its cover or that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. But in fact, artwork very often is judged by the way it is handled and by the way it is presented. So you want your work to be presented in the best way possible. And it's not just for the judge's benefit. It makes a difference with the buyer as well. There's what's called a perceived value to art that's added when you've put your work into a good frame or when it's well presented. And then of course, arrange for the safe and timely delivery of your work to the exhibition. Most often the handing in dates are specific dates and times, very limited time frames, windows that you can make the delivery. And oftentimes if your work gets there a little bit late, then you're out of luck. I mean, we would have people calling us and saying, oh, I just can't get there in time. Is it all right if I deliver the work tomorrow? Well, the answer unfortunately was no, because the judges are making their final selections tonight. If your work isn't here, it won't be seen by the judges and it can't be included. So obviously you need to arrange for the artwork to get there at the right time and you need to make sure that it gets there in one piece in prime condition. If you're shipping your work from overseas, it should really be created. It should be in a wooden box. If you're shipping work that is glazed, they have special tape, glass tape that you can put over the front of it. You cover the whole surface of the glass and the purpose for that is that if the, if the glass is broken in transport, the glass is held together by the tape and it doesn't go in and cut the artwork. You know, it's one thing to get, have your work get there and have it not be able to be shown because there's damage to the frame or to the, um, to the glazing, but it's far more devastating if you get there and your paper, your work has been cut by broken glass and is therefore then destroyed. The advantage of using this particular type of tape is that it goes on easily and it comes off really clean. So it doesn't leave a sticky mess behind and it's easy um, for the organizers to then include the work in the exhibition without having to go to a lot of extra trouble. If you tend not to frame your artwork and every exhibition will have its own rules as to whether or whether or not something needs to be framed. But if you tend to show your work without a frame, you need to make sure that the edges are clean touch them up if it's white paint, black paint, whatever suits the work. If your artwork actually wraps around the frame, that's fine, but you want to make sure that the edges are clean and that it's well presented. After you've touched them up and they're dry, then wrap them. You can get this cling film on a roll, wrap the edges with cling film so that they stay clean. And so they stay looking nice all the way up to the time that the work is hung. Something else I was going to ask was, let's imagine these artists have gone one step further, their work has been shortlisted and an artist goes to all that trouble of getting their work to the gallery and the expense as well and it still isn't hung. Has it all been in vain for them? Yes, I know it's incredibly disappointing but still there is an opportunity here, an opportunity to make the most of it from a marketing point of view. You should not be in the least bit shy, you should be very proud of the fact that you have been shortlisted for an exhibition. So you absolutely still want to go ahead and promote the exhibition, just as you would if you were participating fully, if your art was being hung. Get that information up on your website, put it on your blog, Facebook, social media, what, whatever means you use to put out information about your art and your successes, because this is a success. And you want to tell your fans and collectors, your public, you want to go ahead and send out the press releases to local or national publications. You really want to shout about it and 
announce and be proud of the fact that you were shortlisted for an exhibition. Shortlisting is something still very worthwhile to add to your CV. So your work is hung and you've got into the exhibition. What can that artist do to really make the most of that opportunity? Because it really is a good opportunity for them. It is a good opportunity. And remember, open exhibitions are not just about selling. You're there to take advantage of the opportunity in any way that you can. Of course, the icing on the cake is if you sell your work too. But there are many other ways to take advantage of this opportunity. Again, particularly if your work is going to be hung, get your press releases out, get the information up on your website, out in social media, send out your e-blasts. Make sure that people know that you're included in this exhibition and that your work has been selected. Ideally, I'd say usually, but ideally the, or, the exhibition organizers will give you marketing materials that you can use. Their logo, links, PDFs with information, whatever it is that they've used, their branding for the show, they'll usually pass that on to you so that you can then pass it on as well. And if they haven't provided them, then by all means ask. You're doing them a favor as well as a favor for yourself. So ask what they have in the way of marketing materials that you can then send out. Plan to attend as many of the events as possible, whether that's the private view, an artist reception, you know, there's for the RA, for the RWA in Bristol, there are varnishing days. So obviously in this day and age, artists don't go in and varnish their work in place usually might touch up something if you see something got damaged, but uh, those events are social networking events. So you still go, you still, you know, if there's a, a blessing on the exhibition, you go because this is an opportunity possibly to meet the judges, to um, network with other artists. Just enjoy, really, the fact that you are there amongst the others that are participating. And it shows your appreciation for the opportunity as well. Just as an aside, Obviously, you know, sometimes the road is rocky getting there, the event. But if you have feedback for the organizers, the varnishing day or the night of the private view is not the time to give it to them. <laughs> save, save it and send it after the event. Say, thank you, it was great to participate. By the way, you know, you might want to have this feedback, you know, or ask. But don't do it in the heat of the moment because they've got a million other things to think about. And last of all, and this is really important, this is not an opportunity for you to bring all of your marketing materials and leave them lying around the gallery for the exhibition. This is a group exhibition, and it's not a platform for you to try and hijack. Now, having said that, if something, if somehow the press picks you up and they want to uh, interview you or something like that, that's a different it, that's something different, and an example of that is a, a little over a year ago in January, Kelvin Okafor um, was the runner-up at the Court Street event in London, and the BBC came and interviewed him at the exhibition, and that led on to a lot of other opportunities for him. So if you have won an award, make sure that you get some pictures. This is um, an example. This is in the bottom left. This is at the Mall Gallery. Kelvin had just quite a run, actually, all of last year. There was an award given there. He was, after being interviewed at the gallery in Cork Street, then he was invited to speak on BBC World News. And this is another event. He was at the Science Museum, and people were, you know, lining up for autographs. So, you know, if you have that opportunity, seize it, obviously. But those were all invitations that he received from the organizers. So it, that's a little bit different than taking a big stack of your cards or brochure, you know, and leaving them lying around the gallery. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Take advantage of what you can, but don't, you know, try and hijack it on this slide, I guess. Uh, we've covered quite a lot today. Um, and there have been a few people sending in some questions, um, and it would be great if we can get to some of those. But first, you did touch briefly on online and other types of open exhibitions. Can you say why you decided to start Art Has No Borders rather than just looking for a new venue for Cork Street open exhibitions? Um, I can. Again, you know, I started seeing a real shift to online, and I think that it has some advantages for artists, particularly because we were working with a lot of artists who were abroad. So it really was an international exhibition. When we started publishing iArt Books for the iBookstore, one thing that was evident right away is that it's a huge audience. So our publications go into iBookstores, 50 territories worldwide. 
So it's a much, much bigger audience than we could ever hope to get through the door at Cork Street. Books themselves have direct links within them. So if your artwork is included in the book, um, they see your artwork, they see your details, and then right there in that moment, they can click and go directly to your website. Because it's not a physical event, there's a low cost to participate, and you can actually submit your best work. So, you know, obviously every artist wants to continue to improve, and they hope that their next painting is better than the one before. But sometimes, you know, there's that one favorite you have. And if it's, if it's been sold or it's in the past, you don't have an opportunity to enter that in a, in a physical open exhibition. But in this instance, you can. So I think that because the work isn't for sale that's in the book, it's just showcasing the artists themselves. So there were just quite a number of reasons. And also my husband used to hang all of the work at Court Street, and he's getting old, so he's here. <laughs> <laughs> Do it all from your computer now. <laughs> That's it, yeah. <laughs> right, should we take some questions? Because I think we've got a few. Okay. I can see one. Jane asked, what are the good resources for artists that they can use? Where oh. can they find things? Yeah, great question. There's actually a lot of directories online. Um, if you Google artist opportunities or open exhibitions for artists, that's one way to do it. Do you have on the website, Hannah, is there a list of links that artists can go to? Because there's artlist.com is one and Art Deadline. Yeah, we're going to be getting a list up soon about all those kind of directories that we can put on. Some of that we've advertised our, our stuff yeah. in. So, yeah. yeah. So there are a lot of great ones. Sometimes there, there are more of them in the States, it seems like. The Seer, S-E-E-R dot com or dot net, based in London, and they have a lot of them. A-N has some. Um, just all kinds. And also check in magazines as well. So artists and illustrators, they have a little directory in the front where they list it. SAA, which is Society for All Artists, they have an annual competition, but they also list in the back different types of exhibitions. You know, when we stopped doing the open, the Cork Street open exhibitions and Art Erotic and all that, we stopped doing our monthly online newsletter, which listed deadlines for a lot of competitions. So, you know, if that's something that you, that you artists were using a lot or you found to be a really good resource, send Hannah an email and we'll see if maybe she can restart that. Because just like this webinar isn't just about Art Has No Borders, it's kind of under the umbrella of my attitude for helping artists just market their work and get their work seen. So, you know, we're happy to sort of maybe re... I'm kind of looking at Hannah to see if she's going to shoot me or not, but there's one more thing to do. But, but if it's something that people find really useful, then we'll see what we can do to reinstate that. Yeah, no, definitely. JJ was saying artshow.com is a good site as well. And that is, yeah, that is a good one to check out opportunities on. Great, great. You know, I'm sorry if you guys are having a hard time hearing me. We will be posting this as a replay, and we'll look at the replay and see if we can't edit the sound some as well and see if we can't improve that. Um, yeah, one question here has come up, actually. People are asking about courier services. And, you know, there's for things like the RA and for mall galleries, they have these drop-off points that are sort of usually in different cities along the way. So... I really recommend those over shipping with, say, DHL or your own individual private because they have the expertise and the experience in handling the art. And sometimes it's a little bit of a hassle to drive to get your work to them. And, of course, there is also a fee. But it is worth using something like that if you have the chance rather than taking the chance on it not being delivered when they say it's going to or not having it insured properly. I just want to thank everybody for listening and for putting up with us as we sort out the technical difficulties. We'll keep trying to improve that. And again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. And thank you, Hannah, for having me, actually. I'm sure you'll be talking to other people, judges. We've got some judges lined up for you to talk to and different people that are useful. And again, we'll try and republish some of those thin exhibition information where we talk about framing and shipping your work and things like that. So if you have specific things that you'd like us to focus on, then just let us know. Yeah, if you email us at info at arthasnoborders.com, we can get back to you on any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you very much, Catherine. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Bye.